Good evening. Yes, so indeed, I will um, share you know, some of the insights I got from these three years of research into the emergence of a new management paradigm, the emergence of a new way to think about, to, to structure and run organizations. Um, my sense is, and I think it's a sense of a growing number of people, I'm curious if you share that perspective, is that there's something broken with the way we run organizations today. Um, there's something just in the way we go about our management, our budgets, our targets, our, that feels exhausted. Um, you might have seen these same statistics regularly. There are institutes that poll you know, thousands and thousands of people in different industries, different companies um, about their happiness at work. And what you see is very, very predictable. In almost all of these things, you see that there's two-thirds to three-quarters of employees that say that they're disengaged from their work. You know, they're, they show up with their bodies, but they don't really show up with their hearts, right? And they come mostly because, you know, they have to make a living, collect a paycheck, but, but there, there really isn't much fire, much, much passion. And this is true not only at the lower levels of organizations where you tend to have more routine jobs where, you know, people might feel more powerless at the bottom of organizations, of, of pyramids. Um, this seems to be true at the higher, even the very highest level of organizations. Um, in many conversations I've had with very senior leaders, you know, if you have a truly heartfelt conversation, you know, with closed doors, almost all of them will admit that they're tired of the rat race. Um, you know, they're tired of the email overload, they're tired of spending their days, their weeks, their lives in, in meetings. Um, you know, they're tired of the, the politics that they have to play, you know, the ego games, the infighting, the silos, the bureaucracy that, you know, happens uh, a lot in organizations, you know, these complicated approval mechanisms, um, you know, every year another tedious budgeting cycle uh, that you have to go through and, you know, targets that get applied. And there just seems to be a, a growing sense of being tired of that game, of, of sensing, you know, there should be something more. Um, and in many cases, this, I think, is linked to also a question of meaning. You know, that, you know, there's a question we often try to suppress, which is this question of, you know, what's the meaning behind all that, right? And in, unfortunately, too many organizations, that question isn't an easy one to answer. You know, how is what I'm doing, you know, somehow serving the greater good, you know, somehow serving a better world? And the way I describe it now is, you know, kind of using corporate language, but the same thing is true um, in pretty much all organizations. I mean, nurse, nurses and doctors are leaving hospitals in, in record numbers because we've somehow turned hospitals into these, you know, pretty soulless machines, right? Um, and teachers are leaving the teaching profession, which is a great profession of vocation, in great numbers because somehow something is so soulless about our, our schools. And I think that strangely this is good news. Um, I think that this is the sign that it is like, you know, birth pain. You know, it's the sign that something old is dying and that something new might be emerging. Um, and so I've researched over the last three years the emergence in many different geographies industries of really extraordinary organizations that have been founded by people that you know have done a fair bit of a personal journey sometimes a spiritual journey and found that from that perspective you know they just didn't want to run organizations the way we do today and they went onto this you know mad you know quest for doing it in different in different ways and what they've achieved is is really quite remarkable and what's even more remarkable is that they didn't know of each other. You know, they work in very different industries. They thought they were the only fools, the only crazy ones, you know, daring to challenge, you know, the current, you know, things we learn in, in business schools. But they ended up with remarkably similar ways of operating. And so I believe that we're stumbling here on something that is about to emerge 
that there's a, a new management paradigm, a, a whole new way to think about organizations that is just emerging, just as we, many of us sense that the old one you know, is getting to, to its limits. Now, I'm, you know, when I share that, when I share that I believe that there's a whole new management paradigm that is you know, just emerging at this moment, um, you know, I'm curious how, how that lands with you. Like, you know, if you're like me at the beginning of the research or like you know, many people I share this with, you know, this evokes two opposing reaction, right? There's, there's one part in many of us that says, yeah, hell yes, I hope that is true. You know, we're, you're ready for some change. You know, we, we could do with better ways to, to run organizations. Um, and then there's another part of us that says, yeah, but isn't that just, you know, wishful thinking? You know, isn't that just, you know, naive? Isn't that just, you know, dreaming of a better world? You know, you know can we really fundamentally reinvent the way we run organizations, right? And very often there's these two, these two opposing voices. Um, and as a way to start, I'd just like to do a, a quick show of hands. You probably have these two voices. And if I force you to say which one of the two is louder, you know, and be honest with yourself, be honest with me, I can take it, you know, um, which one would you heed? So maybe raise your hand. Those of you who say, yes, I believe, you know, there's a good chance that something new uh, is emerging. You know, we're ready for, for you know, reinventing the way we, we run organizations. Right? Who would? Um, okay. And who is on the? Who uh, you know has the other voice that's louder? The voice that says, yeah, I'd love to believe that, but you know, come on, let's be honest. Right? Okay. So I'd say two thirds for the first one and, and one third for the second one. Okay. So that's enough of the second one to spend some time briefly to maybe start sharing with you why, why this might not be just you know, wishful thinking, why this might not, not just be daydreaming. Okay. Um. And you know that voice in us that says, come on, you know, we, we're unlikely to reinvent something as fundamental as you know, how we run organizations, is a voice that I think comes from the assumption that, you know, come on, the way we do things now will be the way we do it in the future. They have, you know, other way we've done them in the past. You know, it's a kind of a extrapolation from the present forward. And we know that that's not true. We know that once in a while, humanity fundamentally shifts its thinking on some important topics. Okay, and I want to take a little detour to share a little story that I think illustrates as well. Okay, um, I'm not going to make a quiz. This is Aristotle, the Greek philosopher. Um, and he wrote in a treatise in 350 before Christ that women have fewer teeth than men. Okay. Now, today we know this to be rubbish, right? Women has, have as many teeth as men have. But the extraordinary thing is that it took 2,000 years to find out. You know, it took 2,000 years for someone to have this crazy revolutionary idea to say, why don't we just count? Right? So we had to wait for the Renaissance you know, to start to get the scientific mindset that now we take for granted. Now as children, we learn you know, in primary school, we learn you, know, you, you have a hypothesis and then you test it. Right? It's the most obvious thing in the world. It's almost unthinkable for us to think, like, how did these people think at the time? How could they just blindly trust authority? Okay. But scientific thinking just wasn't present before that time. Now, it's easy for us to look back and, and kind of you know, smile at you know, how silly people were then. What I find more interesting is you know, how my generations you know, down the line look at us and maybe say, oh, you know, these people were pretty simplistic. Um, and I think there's good reasons to believe that they will indeed think that of us. Right? And I'll take another example you know, taken from anatomy, and then you know, I'll shift to speaking about organizations. Right? So these are some neurons, some nerve cells. Um, I have a question for you. How many brains do we human beings have? Right? How many? One? The clever ones say two, kind of, you know, the right brain and the left brain. Well, it turns out that, you know, science tells us, today at least, we know that we have three brains. We have the massive brain in our head, 
but we have a fully functioning, you know, differentiated autonomous brain in the heart, and we have a brain in our guts. They're smaller, but they're not, they're not that small, right? The brain in our guts has the size of the brain of a cat. And the brain in our heart has, you know, the size of the brain of a, of a mouse, you know, of a, of a laboratory rat, you know, that we use often to simulate how humans behave. And these three brains work independently of each other. And what is fascinating about this is A, that we don't know, right? You know, how, how come we don't know, even though that's, you know, just a, a matter of fact? And the more extraordinary thing is that we've only found out about these brains in the middle of the 1990s of the other two brains. Even though we could have discovered these brains, you know, 100 years earlier, because all you need is a corpse, a knife, and a very crude microscope, and you see these nerve cells, right? That they're not hidden. And so when they were discovered, people were asking the question, how come, you know, we haven't found out about them sooner? And the most convincing answer, I think, that was given is that in our current worldview, we believe that for any system to operate, we need one boss, right? We need someone in command. And so for you know, the human body, we have that brain, and that's good. You know, the, the idea that we have three brains working in distributed intelligence, when no one is the boss of anyone else, somehow doesn't, you know, it's just unthinkable. And so scientists had found this brain, so let's not look for another one. And if we find some nerve cells that can't, you know, can't be true, can't mean anything. And it's not, maybe not a surprise that we had to wait till the middle of the 1990s when the internet emerged for people somehow to start thinking in distributed intelligence and to accept the notion that we could have three separate brains working you know, in, in collaboration with none being the boss of anyone else. Right. So just to give you a sense that you know, once in a while, you know, humanity changes its perspective and is able to see things that before it wasn't able to see, right? And a lot of philosophers and historians and anthropologists have looked back at these big leaps in thinking in human history. And they all agree on the, you know, the big steps that we've had. There were one or two steps before that, but at some point we went from small bands to you know, larger tribes, and that was a big step up in you know, the human journey. And then there was the agrarian revolution, a whole different world. That's when we started trusting authority and, you know, you know trusting for 2,000 years that women have fewer teeth than men. And then there was another shift, you know, to the, to the scientific, you know, mindset to the, the industrial age where we started counting. And, you know, for a few decades we've been entering this postmodern information world with, again, our thinking changing. And now there's something new that seems to be emerging. Many people write about it. There isn't yet a term that has really made it. You know, maybe you, some people call it the integral age or the holistic age or the authentic age. Um, we'll see which, which term sticks. And what we know is that at each of these steps, we reinvented everything. We made a step up in technology. We changed uh, the politics fundamentally. Economics changed, right? Went from hunting and gathering to agriculture to industry. And one thing that has been mostly overlooked is that we fundamentally at each stage invented a new management paradigm, a new way to run organizations. Right? And so the notion that we might do this again doesn't sound quite so crazy if you just look, you know, this has happened four or five times in the past, you know, this will only be the fifth time, you know, that we will do kind of a major step up. Okay. I'll quickly run you through you know, the first steps to give you a, a sense of these changes. And then we'll spend most of the time discussing you know, about what I found out from these extraordinary organizations that already operate kind of at this new emerging stage. Okay. The very first organizations were very crude. There were people from one tribe temporarily gathering under their chief to go out and fight the neighboring tribe, submit them, and make slaves. Okay, very crude organizations. You know, no strategy of sides, no flip chart meetings, 
you know, just go out there, you know, make slaves. Okay. And what is interesting is that today there are still some organizations that run along pretty much these principles, which are street gangs, mafias, mercenary armies. So how do these organizations operate? Um, basically, they're very small, pretty unstable, and the boss has to constantly inspire fear. And the people below him, really physical fear, because if he shows the slightest sign of weakness, somebody will come from the back and backstab him to try and take his place. Right? So very, very informal, very, very much fear-based. And so you know, the, the metaphor, if you want to think about these organizations, is they're really like wolf packs, right? You have the alpha wolf, you know, that always projects power until he gets old and then a younger wolf comes and, you know, and kills him. And then came, came 5,000 years ago the agrarian revolution. And the agrarian world is a very different world. It's not just a world of power, it's a world of rules, right? All agrarian um, civilizations um, started to have institutionalized religion, so you know, God-given rules. They started. They all are highly stratified caste systems, or you know, very strong social hierarchies. And the organizations they invented um, are very much different from these ones. So the typical organization of that time is, is the Catholic Church, right? Is maybe the archetypical organizations, armies. Most government agencies today and public school systems are run in that way. So these are highly hierarchical, highly stable organizations. Um, and compared to the previous ones, they came up with two extraordinary breakthroughs. The first one is they invented the formal hierarchy. They invented the org chart, the boxes, right? You know, in previous ones, you didn't have formal reporting lines and, and boxes. What is extraordinary about that is that now the priest accepts to be a priest and doesn't spend his days scheming about how he's going to backstab the bishop, right? Or at least most of the time he's not, right? Um, and that makes that you can have very, very large organizations with lots of levels of hierarchy where the pope, you know, hasn't met all of the priests. He doesn't need to inspire fear. He can send them off as missionaries to the other side of the world and, you know, the system will still function. And the second major breakthrough is replicable processes. Right? With agriculture, we learned you know, how next year's harvest will be planned ahead, like last year's harvest, like previous year's harvest. The Catholic Church next year will do the same thing it does this year as it does last year, as pretty much as it has done 100 years ago. Public schools will do next year, teach you know, the lesson plan pretty much the same way they've te taught it this year than they've taught it last year. Right? And if you take that together, these organizations are able to do things that the mafias, etc., were totally unable to even think about. You know, they, you know, these kind of organizations have built cathedrals that take 200 years to build. You know, they built pyramids, they built irrigation systems. They just are able to tackle things that were just of an order of magnitude that was unthinkable before. And that is a general pattern. Every new stage of organization is just dramatically more powerful than the previous one. I'm giving you really very quick tour, if, if you're interested to dive deeper into it, uh, you know, the, the first part of the book is detailing that out in more detail. Um, so I, I hope you bear with me as I just give you a kind of a whirlwind tour. And then came, you know, this big breakthrough where the scientific breakthrough, you know, the industrial revolution where we started counting teeth, right, St instead of, you know, trusting authority. And so in that worldview, you know, the world isn't given by God anymore with immutable laws. It's actually a very different world. You know, the, the world of the Enlightenment um, is a world that is a complex mechanic. And the more I understand that world you know, through scientific inquiry, the faster I am to understand the world, you know, the more profit I can reap. You know, if I'm faster than my competitors, you know, then more profit for me. Right? So this is a worldview of constant innovation, constant optimization, you know, constantly going faster to gain profit, market share, or you know, personal status, personal wealth. So, you know, these orange organizations, you know, the colors come from one of these philosophers. He's given these stages colors, and, you know, this stage is called orange. You know, most multinational organizations, you know, Wall Street, you know, the consulting firms, you know, operate from that model. 
Um, and again, these came with fantastic breakthroughs compared to the previous model. The first one is these organizations invented innovation. You know, in the previous ones, you know, pretty much no innovation. You know, all of the prosperity that humanity has had over the last 100, 150 years comes because organizations have innovated. Right? So all of the wealth, all of the you know, increase in, um, you know, in our um, expected living you know, is, comes pretty much down to this. And so these organizations have invented stuff like R&D departments. Right? So the, the Catholic Church doesn't have an R&D department. You know, the public school system, unfortunately, doesn't have R&D departments. Right? They invented you know, product management. They invented marketing. You know, they invented uh, project teams, cross-functional task forces. You know, all of that you know, comes from this year. Another huge breakthrough is the notion of accountability. Right? In the previous organizations, bosses simply tell people what and how to do. You don't even need to measure anything. I just tell you what to do. You know. you know, priests don't have KPIs. Right? Um, here, suddenly, there's a big, big innovation, which is, hey, as a, as a boss, I will give you a target, but then how you achieve that target, you know, as, you as long as you stay more or less within legality, I don't really mind too much. Right? So the whole management by objective, with all of those innovations, you know, 360 feedbacks and budgets and targets and annual appraisals, uh, right? Incentives, all of that, you know, comes from here. So all of the HR process that are linked. And the third major breakthrough, which we take for granted now, but is meritocracy. In all previous organizations, you know, the, the Pope was always from a noble family and priests were from the peasantry. Right? And a priest would never dream of becoming a pope. That was just not. Right? And now suddenly we have this idea that you know, the male rule bo boy can become the CEO. You know? Basically the one th who's cleverest at counting the teeth, right? he should make it to the next level. Right? Which is a huge liberation on the scale of human history. And then, you know, starting after the Second World War and you know, accelerating in the recent decades, you know, we've started to shift into you know, this kind of post-modern, you know, post-industrial, um, sometimes we call it you know, the information age, the, the knowledge economy, um, where suddenly we re realize, oh, I'm always forgetting about the metaphors, I'm sorry. So the metaphors, if you want to think about these organizations, is you know, organizations as machines. You know, it's, it's funny if you look at it, how much engineering language we use for how we run organizations today, right? We design and redesign an organization, right? We pull some levers and we, you know, pull the accelerator or hit the brakes or, you know, there's so many, so much from engineering language that has made it into organizations, right? Now, the downside of that is somehow, if you think about it, it's that basically people are a bit like cogs, right? And you need to align them really, really well so that they all work perfectly well together. You know, that, in this worldview, that's what great leaders should do. And in the postmodern worldview, where it's really a lot about information and knowledge, there suddenly, you know, the shifting such that, you know, people aren't just cogs. You know, we have to manage, you know, people's thinking and we have to get the most out of people. So, you know, suddenly we have to look at all these soft aspects, right? And this, we only look at the hard aspects, right? You, you only look at the, at the machine. And so, you know, you have then these incredibly um, powerful culture-driven organizations that have been written a lot about, right? Organizations that really say, for us, it's all about culture. There's a, a famous sentence, um, right, that says that, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? Um, it's Peter Drucker who said that. And the idea is, you know, if we have a, a, a powerful culture, if people just love coming to work, you know, if the people are just happy, if people are passionate, then you know, everything else will be all right. You know, we'll have a great strategy. But the other one is not true. If we have a great strategy, but people are not passionate, then not much will happen. Right? And so the, the breakthroughs have all to do with the, the soft side of things. So these organizations are very, very committed to their culture um, and to, to their values. And the values in these organizations, people aren't cynical about the values because they really, really mean something. Um, they're fanatical about, about empowerment, the idea that you should you know, push 
things, you know, decisions to the lowest kind of level. And then a whole discussion about we should step away from purely the shareholder model and we should go to this kind of stakeholder model where we put, you know, suppliers and, uh, and customers and uh, employees all on the same level. Right? And this is a, a revolution that is still ongoing and there's lots of research that seems to indicate that again these organizations pretty much dramatically outperform you know, the previous, the, the orange organizations. Okay, and so the question then becomes, oh no, again, I forgot the metaphor. So the, the metaphor, if you hear leaders of these organizations talk, it's funny how consistently they talk about we are a family. You know, their idea is we are a family, everybody here you know, needs to work in harmony, everybody here should you know, feel welcome, should feel that they have their place. It's a very, very strong metaphor that these leaders use. Right, so we've had organizations as wolf packs, organizations as armies, organizations as machines, organizations as families. And then the question is, you know, what's next? Right? Um, and so over the last three years, I've been spending a lot of time identifying and studying in great depth a number of organizations. 20, 30 organizations and 12 in particular depth that are pretty large organizations. They all have several hundred, most of them several thousands of people that already operate on something that is just totally new. And as I told you, what struck me is the degree to which, even though they don't know each other, they operate in very similar ways. So I really believe that we're hitting onto that, that new level. And um, you know, these are the names of these organizations. And I show them because I believe that probably you won't have heard of, probably of, of none of them, or maybe one or two of them. Which is quite extraordinary. They're, they're really extraordinary successful organizations and we haven't heard about them. And it, it seems that they're so out there, so strange, that few people have looked at them. The few articles that have appeared in the press about them say, here are these really super successful organizations, and yet somehow it doesn't make any sense. It shouldn't work, so somehow at some point this, this thing will crumble. That's really the, you know, the few articles that has appeared about one or two of these organizations. And it's maybe only when you look at several of them that you see that they're, you know, it's not just madness, there's actually a system behind it. And they operate in in very, very different industries. You know, so there are some mental health hospitals, there's a school, there are some you know, automotive suppliers, so there's some blue color, there's some white color, um, some in the US, some in Europe, some are global. Um, so you know, this new model seems to be working in pretty much any kind of environment. And let me tell you about you know, the story of one of these organizations. It's an organization in the Netherlands called Burtzorg. Um, and they're active in neighborhood nursing. So nurses that go to, you know, often old people or sick people or, you know, people have had an accident in their homes so that they don't work in hospitals, they work in homes. And it's a great story to tell because, you know, you know, these different colors that we've go, you know, talked about, you know, this story illustrates this really, really well. Um, the Netherlands has had these neighborhood nurses for a very, very long time, since the you know, 18th century. Every neighborhood had their nurse. And in the 1980s, you know, by that time, the, the state had started to pay most of the bills through Social Security. And the state had this very logical idea to say, hey, let's push these nurses to join organizations because there will be economies of scale. Right? And it will be nice for the nurses too. They can now sometimes sleep at night or take holidays while other nurses take over. Right? And so they push these nurses to regroup. And what happened then is that this whole orange innovation optimization logic took over. Right? So these organizations started saying, hey, wouldn't it be great if we specialized nurses? So we'll have some nurses who only do the intake, the first, very first meeting to see what is needed, you know, what the doctor has prescribed. And, and then um, let's have 
the expensive nurses do only the technically difficult stuff, right? And all of the rest we can do with cheaper nurses. And then they said, hey, you know, let's not have the patients call the nurses directly. Let's actually take the phones away from the nurses and let them call to a call center so we can just, you know, arrange which nurse goes to see which patient, right? And so they installed, a, you know, a call center. And then they said, hey, um, we actually can do some planning because we noticed that some nurses are much more productive than others. So let's have standard times, right? And so they introduced, really, right? A shot is 10 minutes. And changing a compression stocking is two and a half minutes, right? Seriously, coming in, saying hi to the old person, and two and a half minutes, and you're out. And now we can plan, right? We can use basically Google Maps to make a planning. And so the nurses receive a plan in the evening saying, you know, here, you know, you start at 8, and from 8 to 8.10 you go there, and then you have three minutes at 8.13, you stay in your stocking. And so that's how most organizations work in the Netherlands. Right? And then they started, of course, merging among themselves to make bigger economies of scale. And then you had local managers and district managers and national managers and mostly young people who are not nurses, you know, who don't really know the business. And so the nurses, you know, think, you know, what can these young kids, you know, teach us? Um, and the result is that clients hate the system. You know, it's often old, sometimes confused people who see a new nurse coming in every day. You know, the nurse is hurried and goes like, um, okay, so what is it? Okay, I have to give you a shot. And then the old person says, ah, I know that's what it says on paper, but let me explain. It's a bit more difficult. And the nurse says, no, no, sorry, I have no time. <coughs> you know, and, and this goes on. Right? And the nurses hate it because, you know, they, that's really, you know, professional vocation. And they've been turned into these, you know, people that just get sent at random, do some stuff, and they've lost all contact with, with the clients. Yeah? And there's this guy called Jos de Bloch, who was one of these neighborhood nurses for 10 years and went into management, tried to change that from the inside and didn't succeed. And not so long ago, in 2006, early 2007, he created Bürzorg. Right. Just a group of 10 people. And he figured, if I have 10 nurses, 10 to 12, I have all the economies of scale I need. And let me just, you know, self-organize, self-manage. And so we'll reintegrate everything. So we'll do our own intake. We'll do our own planning, right? Um, and, you know, that worked really well. The clients liked it so much so that, you know, now in 2014, they are 8,000 people. There is 80% of all neighborhood nurses that work for Bürzorg. They've gone basically from zero to 80% market share in seven, eight years, simply because nurses are deserting all the other employees, not just sending their CVs, they receive 400 CVs a month and say, sure, you want to work for us? No problem. We'll tell you who else is in your neighborhood. You guys go and meet. And when you have 10 to 12 people, you come and talk to us and, you know, we'll teach you how to run this thing. Because what is extraordinary is they have these 8,000 people and they have a headquarters of only 25. And the big part of what the, the headquarters does is teach these groups of 10 to 12 how to operate without a boss. So there's the only nurses, there's no manager in there. And so they teach them very, very dedicated techniques of how do you run meetings? How do you make decisions according to these principles? How do you deal with conflict when, you know, ine inevitably there will be conflict? Right. Clients love it because, you know, now every client has, you know, one or two nurses at most that they see. So there's a really deep bonding. And what the nurses do is they don't go in and take shots. They actually sit down and drink coffee, which sounds strange, but it's linked to this notion of purpose. The way Beardsor sees its purpose is not to just do medical acts. They want to help people live rich and meaningful lives and autonomous lives. And so they want to make people as autonomous as they can be. And so they will come in there, you know, drink some coffee and ask people, what can you still do? You know, do you have children that can help you so that I, I don't need to necessarily help you? Oh, you don't get along with your children? Do, you, do we maybe make a family meeting and we try to see if we can rekindle something? They might call a neighbor, you know, young family and say, do you know the old lady there? Do you mind if we put you in touch so that you can sometimes help you? Um, and there's been a, an Ernst & Young study done on the financial part because you could say, yeah, of course, you know, if you take time for a coffee and if you take time to sit down in meetings, then of course, you know, that's easy. But what, 
you know, the study found is that Pyotrk only uses 40% of the hours prescribed by doctors because they make patients autonomous so much faster. So there's a strange paradox. Even though they take so much time drinking coffee, they save the Dutch state hundreds of millions of, you know, of euros every year, especially now that they have 80% market share. Right? And so now the Dutch state is really going like, can't you go into other domains? Because you know, we kind of like what you do. Um, right? So Beardsorg is one of the organizations that I've researched that already operates at this new stage. And again, these organizations come with a number of breakthroughs, right? And I will briefly tell you about the, the three breakthroughs I've seen that are common to these, to these organizations. The first one is self-management. So these organizations manage to operate at very large scales. Some have thousands, tens of thousands of employees entirely without the pyramid, entirely without anyone being the boss of anyone else. And I know that sounds extraordinary. It sounds like a recipe for chaos. Right? How could you ever run a large organization without hierarchy? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. By the way, I, I wasn't expecting this when I started the research. Right? Um, my idea was, I think we've all grown up with this idea that you know, maybe we can have an organ you know, a group of four or five people working without, without a boss. Okay, that's okay, four or five people. But as soon as you're more than that, come on, right? You need a structure, you need a boss. Right? And what I found out is that the truth is, yes, you need structure, but no, you don't need a boss. This is really a place where we need to upgrade our thinking, right? Basically, the story of going from one brain to three brains. Let me suggest a different way to think about hierarchy in organizations, which I think is more truthful. And it's the following. It's that hierarchy kind of works OK in environments with low complexity. You know, then, then hierarchy is, is doing OK. So if complexity is low, you can have a pyramid. But as soon as you have high complexity, hierarchy is simply out of its depth. Because you see, hierarchy always stacks up in a pyramid and pushes all of that complexity up to the top. And there's only so much complexity that the few people at the top can, can handle, can work with. Right? And actually, if you look at all truly complex systems that exist in the world today, they all operate with mechanisms more powerful than hierarchy. Okay. Let me give you an example. Um, the global economy. Right? Billions of consumers, millions of companies, you know, trillions of decisions made every day, and there's no one in command, right? You don't have a boss of the global economy. Right? The you know, the only two countries that still try to run an economy with a pyramid are North Korea and Cuba, right? And I think it's quite funny that, you know, we, we think this idea is ludicrous for an economy. I mean, who would run their economy like North Korea and Cuba? But we insist that we, that's the way we should run things inside organizations, right? So here you have hugely complex system. You have lots of structure. You'll have lots of coordinating mechanisms but you don't have a boss. Right? This is a picture taken inside one single human cell. Now, a single human cell is of a complexity that is just breathtaking. At every moment in time, there's dozens of chemical reactions and information exchanges that happen. And all of that happens wonderfully. You know, and within the cell, there isn't a boss. There's structure, there's coordinating mechanisms, but there's no boss. Take the human brain, 85 billion cells, 10 times more than humans on the planet, right? All of them, you know, working in parallel. And there isn't one cell that says, hey, I'm the CEO, right? And these are my other body cells from the executive committee, right? 
Again, structure coordinating mechanisms, no boss. Take the morning traffic, hugely complex system. You know, and luckily there isn't one car in the middle of it that doesn't really see what the others are doing that is trying to impose order. Right? So it's a self-regulating system. Again, you know, structure coordinating mechanisms, no boss. Or take a forest. You know, a forest is an incredibly complex ecosystem. You know, we, it looks kind of simple, we see these big trees, but there's really everything from massive trees to you know, billions of you know, microorganisms. And all of that works in some sort of magic. You know, if the, if the, uh, if the winter comes in early, you know, all of that system will adapt at the same time and you know, change information. There isn't you know, one massive tree that is the CEO that says to everyone else, hey, you freeze, don't do anything. You know, me and my buddy trees from the executive committee will come up with a plan, and when we're ready, we tell you what to do. Right? That's just not how complex systems work. And so I have no doubt that as the world is becoming more and more complex, we will naturally have to you know, shift the way we run organizations to principles that underlie all of these complex systems. Right? And I sense that this, this illusion we have about organizations today is that the world is, is becoming so complex and somehow you know, our, our pyramids cannot cope. And the extraordinary thing is that this is you know, already happening. So there are organizations who have cracked the code. They found ways to import this into organizations and have become you know, radically more powerful thanks to it. And again, organizations with you know, several thousands, tens of thousands, thousands of people. And what they've had to do is that they had to reinvent pretty much everything. If you don't have a pyramid, you have to put something else besides. You can't just say, hey, we'll, you know, we'll just get rid of hierarchy, then you have chaos. So you have to replace you know, one consistent set of practices with another one. And so they've had to reinvent pretty much everything. You know, the organizational structures, but you know, how do you run projects? How does information flow? You know, if there's no boss, you know, who decides on who makes how much money? You know, how do you deal with conflicts? You know, how do you de decide you know, who can spend and invest how much money? Right? All of these things they had to invent. And again, what's fascinating is that many organizations that didn't know of each other invented pretty much identical processes and systems. Right. So I'd love to show you all of them, but I'm just going to pick one or two, and maybe you know, at the end, if we have a discussion, you know, we can ask me about some more that you are interested in. But I just want to give you a sense of how is that even possible, right? Because you know, if you're at the place I was at the beginning of the research, you know, there's probably a voice in you that says, come on, that, that cannot just, you know, can't be possible. So one of the first questions people often ask is, uh, so, okay, but in these organizations, if there is no hierarchy, who can make what decision? Right? And traditionally, we think that there's only two ways to make decisions, right? Either hierarchical decision making or consensus. So top-down decision making, you know, we might not like what the boss decides, the boss might make a stupid decision, it might trigger all sorts of politics to try to influence that person, but at least someone makes a decision and, you know, we can move forward. Consensus sounds great in principle, but the problem with consensus, as, you know, if you've tried it, is you know it's often very long and exhausting, and you don't get to a decision, and you know in the end everybody is just frustrated, and somebody says like, can someone please make a decision, whatever it is, you know I don't care, but like at, at least we make a decision. Okay. And in many organizations, by the way, we're a bit in between, right? We we're theoretically in the hierarchical decision making, but we somehow want people to feel included, so we, we do a bit, of, a bit of both. And running large organizations without hierarchy is only possible because these organizations have invented a third way to make decisions. One of these organizations, AES, um, you know, 40,000 people, called it the advice process, and I think it's a, it's a good word for it. The advice process is somehow transcends these two, somehow the 
the best of both worlds. So the way advice process works in principle is that any person in the organization can make any decision, including spending company money, under two conditions. They must have sought advice from people who have expertise, and they must seek advice from people who will have to live with the decision, who will be impacted by the decision. Okay. So if I'm a machine operator, and this happens a lot in these organizations, I can you know, decide to buy a new machine that costs 300,000 euros or, or a million euros. And what I need to do before I make that decision is I need to talk, you know, maybe someone from finance who can tell me about, you know, financial calculations. I might need to talk to an engineer that has an idea of the whole flow of things. And I might, and I have to talk to my colleagues who will have to operate the machine with me. Right. But I don't need to seek any approval. And I don't need to integrate what people say into watered down consensus. So if you've thought my advice, at the end you can say to me, hey, Frederick, I've really listened to what you said, but for these and these reasons, you know, I've decided to still do something different. Right? And the reason this works so well is two things. One, it's a, f a process of collective intelligence. You know, people have to collect the intelligence of people with expertise and people that will live with the decision. And really think about it before they make a decision. But it stays an individual decision. So if I feel strongly about something, I can just make it happen. No one can stop me. I seek advice, I think about it, I make a decision. So you have organizations where everyone is empowered to do whatever they feel is necessary. So imagine just the kind of energy that that <coughs> liberates. And it works remarkably well because at all times, we are on different sides of the equation. So sometimes you come and seek advice from me, and I really hope that you will take my advice into account. So when you come to ask me for advice, you know, I really think about it hard before I discard it. Right? And people know that one of the few ways to get kicked out of these organizations you know, is if you don't respect the advice process, is if you just you know, randomly go and make decisions, because then you know, you're putting in peril the whole, the whole system. Right. And we can talk later about how do you actually kick out people from organizations when there is no boss, right? That's a whole different question. Okay, so one fundamental innovation, a whole new decision-making mechanism. Let me give you, uh, you know, an illustration of that. You know, these organizations, just like any organizations, face the question, who makes how much money? You know, and we know what a charged question that can be. Right? So in today's organizations, you know, it's a boss who tends to decide, you know, if people get a raise or how do you divide up, you know, a pot of bonus, you know, among the, uh, the people that report to you. Now, in these organizations, there isn't anyone who is, who is the boss, so how do they go about it? The... Um, the most beautiful process I found is from an organization called Morningstar. Um, and Morningstar is a company that was started in the 1970s by a guy called Chris Roofer. And he just bought himself a truck to haul tomatoes across the US. Right? And Today he has a small empire. He has four huge, he transports 70% of all tomatoes in the US, and he has four huge factories that process tomatoes. So you imagine big chemical factories with trucks dumping tomatoes in on one side. Every minute a new truck comes by, and there's tomato paste, ketchup coming out of the other side. And he produces 50% of all tomato paste in the US. So if you've ever you know, had ketchup or pasta or pizza in the US, you've certainly had his, his products. And everyone who works in these, you know, these factories works entirely without, without a boss. And so here's how they go about you know, salaries. Once a year, if you work there, you write a letter in which you state, I grant myself a raise of X, 
percent, two percent. And then you state all the reasons why you think that is justified. Okay, and you put in behind that the, the sort of you know, 360 degree feedback, they have a beautiful system for that. And then every plant elects a committee that puts all these letters side by side. Right? And the only thing that this committee does is give advice. You know, this is the advice process. So they might say to you, hey, you haven't given yourself a raise. You've just given yourself, you know, inflation adjustment. You know, you've actually taken on responsibility. I, th I think you should raise your salary by 2%. And to me, they might say, hey, Frederick, you know, your 7% raise, you know, sounds a bit generous. You know, when we compare that to your colleagues, you know, you know, 3, 4% might be more in order. And then you and I are free to do whatever we want. You can raise yours, I can lower mine, but we don't have to, it's just advice. But what happens in these organizations is that all information is public. So if I decide to keep my 7% raise, even though you know, a bunch of colleagues advised against it, you know, I have better proof next year that I'm really worth it. And what Morningstar shows is that people are incredibly good estimators of the salary. So there's roughly 1% of people where the committee says, hey, I think you've been too generous. Most people know, you know. And what is extraordinary about the system is that it forces everyone to grow up. You know, talking, you know, salary isn't a topic there. People don't talk about it. People don't waste any time. If you don't like it, raise it and see what happens, right? So all of the strategizing and haggling and complaining kind of falls away. You know, everybody is just an adult, you know. There's something about our hierarchical relationships where we behave a bit like children that just nag their parents for, you know, more candy, right? And all of that falls away. People just have to grow up. Right? Okay, so this is how they deal with compensation. Now, let me um, you know, share the second breakthrough. So self-management was the first one, you know, operating large organizations entirely without hierarchy. And the second one is one I've called wholeness. Now this one is a, you know, a bit more subtle, but just as powerful. Um, see, in most organizations, there is a, an expectation that we show up in a specific way, that we show up as a, you know, in a professional self. You know, most organizations push us somehow to wear a mask, you know, a professional mask of you know, what is acceptable in organizations. And maybe some of you will say, hey, no, that's not true. You know, I'm exactly the same. I'm at work that I am at home. Uh, and that might be the case, but for most people, that's not the case. And in some cases, I think we delude ourselves. We are so used to wearing that mask that we're somehow even forgot that, that we're wearing it. Right? And uh, here's a way to, to illustrate that. Um, let's take a simple dichotomy, right? We all have our ego, and we all have, you know, sort of deeper part, you know, deeper convictions, longings. And the strange thing is that very quickly in most organizations, we learn that showing up with the ego, you know, showing up in meetings, fighting to look good and, you know, fighting for our careers and stuff, that's pretty acceptable. But showing up with, you know, deeper questions, our, really our deeper hopes, our deeper longings, very quickly becomes very risky. You can take an example in any kind of industry. Let, let's take an example in, um, let's say, the advertising industry. Right? Imagine a colleague calling in all the other colleagues and saying, hey, I want to have a, a really important discussion with you guys. You know, I wonder what we're, I sometimes wonder what we're busy with. I mean, we're creating all these needs with people for products that they actually don't really need, that get produced in China, pollute the world, get shipped over, used once, thrown away. Um, you know, trash the planet, and 
all of those people who can't afford them become unhappy. You know, what are, what are we really dealing with? Now, the person who would call in that, that meeting probably won't make a very long career, right? Um, right, or, you know, take doctor in hospital who would call in a meeting and say, hey, you know, we've reduced, you know, healthcare, you know, we've turned this hospital into these kind of factories and we've forgotten about really what it truly means to care, which is, you know, the relationship with the client, the patient, you know, the, all of the emotional and the spiritual component of healing, right, probably, you know, wouldn't get a very good reception. And so, you know, we learned that, you know, let's not talk too much about, about that and let's just, you know, fight for our careers and, and we, you know, start playing these ego games. You know, another dichotomy is, you know, we, all men or women have a masculine side and have a feminine side, right? And in most organizations, we cl quickly learn that the masculine is appreciated, right? Whether we are man or woman, you know, showing resolve and determination and, you know, being um, very clear on what we want to achieve and, you know, looking forward and not backwards and all of that is, is very much, you know, appreciated. And the more feminine part that we all have, which is the more nurturing, the more caring, you know, the more questioning, the more vulnerable side, we quickly learn that that is a part that, you know, doesn't really help us forward. Right? And so we all tend to show up much more masculine and much more determined than we really are, never showing doubts, never showing vulnerabilities, right? And, you know, another way to look at things is, you know, we all have a rational side, but we all also have all an emotional, an intuitive, a spiritual side. And again, the rational side is very, you know, valued in organizations. But intuitive, you know, if we can't really prove it with numbers, and certainly emotional, no, you know, no emotions in organizations, and the spiritual, no, come on, no, that, you know, that shouldn't be part of organizations, right? And so we end up, you know, showing this very narrow, ego, masculine, rational side of us. And leaving all of that other part that is who we are behind. Um, and this isn't mathematical, you know, but, you know, here just with this little thing, there's one sixteenth, you know, that is showing up. Um, and what these organizations that I researched, um, you know, believe and have found out is when that is the case, the, we also only show up with basically one sixteenth of our energy, of our passion, of our creativity. And so they have put in place very deliberate, very conscious practices to open up that window and to really invite us to show up in the full glory of our humanity, of who we are. And when that happens, you know, things are just extraordinary. You know, people, people in these organizations just, you know, brim with energy because they can be, you know, fully who, we, who they are. And again, there's a great number of things that they have, that they have reinvented. Um, It really starts with the one in the middle that they've created a safe space. Like, if we want to drop that mask and if we want to show up as you know, all of who we are, we have to feel safe, right? Because if, when we show up fully, you know, we, we show who we are, we are vulnerable. And so these organizations have put in place a lot of practices to make it really safe to be yourself. And then they've changed all of the HR processes, right? You know, the, often today, they, they're, the kind of lying starts at, their, at recruitment, right? We, at recruitment, we try very strongly to show only some parts of us and, and not others, right? So it, it already starts there, but, you know, and how we give feedback and how we do performance evaluations and how we run meetings. So all of that, they have rethought them to invite us to be, to be truly human. Right? Um, let me give you, uh, you know, a few examples of that. Um, There's one organization called um, Heiligenfeld. Um, it's a German network of mental health hospitals. They have five mental health hospitals and they're spectacularly successful. They're growing very much because people come from all over Europe to go and be treated there, even if they don't speak German, simply because 
the way they go about mental health treatment, they take, you know, all of that, you know, personal, emotional, spiritual side, they don't just, you know, medicate people. Um, but the way they work internally is, is just fantastic too. Um, and they have this, um, this process in meetings, very, very simple process. Um, and it goes like this. In every meeting room, you have these um, sort of hand symbols, right? Do you might have heard these? Um, and at the beginning, there's a ritual question. You know, who will take these, right? And so one person will just be a volunteer. He participates in a meeting. And that person has just one additional role next to participating in a meeting is whenever he or she feels that someone is speaking from their ego, somebody is trying to win an argument just for the sake of winning an argument, or is fighting for his own career, or is fighting for his own group, you know, that person then, uh, you know, has a very simple task and is to do this, right? And they really do it. And you notice how long it takes for this to decrease. And they, the rules of the game is, while that lasts, hey, <laughs> it rings in the back, while that lasts, Everybody is just supposed to be silent for a minute and just ask themselves, who am I trying to serve? Am I trying to serve me, myself, my career, my team, or am I here in, in service of something greater? And I, I love this practice. It's just one of you know great many practices, but what you find is all of these organizations have a meeting practice because meetings tend to be these moments where we're in public and where egos come, tend to come out, right? We, we don't want to look stupid in front of colleagues. We don't want to you know say something and then be contradicted. And what you have at Heiligenfeld is that people rarely have to use them anymore because people are so used to that. Um, what I've seen there is that, you know, when people only go to grab them, somebody will say, oh yeah, come on, okay, you're right, I'm, I'm sorry, I, you know. Uh, and so you have meetings without ego. I mean, how cool is that? Right? I, I know I, I've been part of some meetings where the only thing you would have heard is this. Right, where there wouldn't have been anything, anything else. Um, now, this is only possible because everyone at Heiligenfeld that starts gets trained in active listening, nonviolent communication. So there's a whole, you know, common knowledge around around this that that people there share. Right. Let me give you another another practice, which I think is just very beautiful. Um, it's a uh, school in Berlin, um, a secondary school, public school, um, that's truly extraordinary. Uh, one thing, one part that's extraordinary is that you know, the whole school is self-managing. So the, the children are self-managing in their learning, the teachers are self-managing, even the parents that are very involved in the school are self-managing. Uh, but what they've really nailed is how can you invite adolescents to be truly themselves? And that's, that's, you know, adolescence is really this, you know, period in our lives where we wear often not one mask, but, but so many different masks, right? Because we so much want to conform to some, to some image. And one of the reasons students learn so little at that time is because they're so busy investing in their masks that they're, you know, that they're not learning. And so this school has lots of beautiful practices, and one of them is this one here. They gather every Friday afternoon for 45 minutes, the whole school, teachers, students, they start by singing a song for five minutes, which you know, puts everyone in tune. And then they have this practice where it's an open microphone. Anyone can walk up to the microphone, say something, student or a teacher. And there's just one kind of rule is you walk up to the microphone to either thank someone or make a compliment. And what happens there is that basically people tell many stories, right? When they go to thank someone. And people always think, you know, that they tell stories about the other, you know, people that you thank, but actually what they reveal is something about themselves, right? So you have these adolescents that go out there and say, hey, on Thursday morning I was really down because I had a fight with my parents and, you know, Sophie, you just, you know, picked me up by saying this and that. And, you know, I really want to thank you for that. And so what happens in the school is that you have adolescents, I mean, think about that, you know, that dare 
to be authentic and dare to be vulnerable in front of 500 people. You know, it's truly, it's truly mind-blowing. And what happens is in the school, you don't have violence problems, right? And children are just, you know, so passionate to learn because, you know, they, in the school, they're accepted in, in, the way, in the way they are, right? There's a deliberate thinking about how can we, how can we drop our masks? How can we, you know, speak and, and show up fully mm -hmm. and dare speak about what matters most to us? So first breakthrough, you know, large organization entirely without management. Second breakthrough, very deliberate practices to open that window and to invite everyone to show up fully, which you know, just brings a level of passion, of creativity, of energy that is unprecedented. And the third breakthrough is one we could call evolutionary purpose. Um, you know, all organizations say that they have a purpose, but ultimately, when it comes down to it, in the end, often, you know, making money is, is the thing that we prioritize over, over purpose, right? And in many organizations, people are a bit cynical about their, about their mission statement. Now, when you talk about purpose, the purpose of Birdsorg is to help people live, you know, rich, meaningful, autonomous lives. And you could say that the way they operate, you know, this, you know, this whole thing is really their competitive advantage, right? That's what made them go from zero to 80% market share. In any traditional organ organizations, they wouldn't speak much about that. That would be their big secret, right? They would, you know, lock their competitive advantage, you know, in a, in a vault like Coca-Cola does with its secret formula, right? What Joseph de Bog did is the opposite. He wrote a book about it where he explains in exact detail how he does it, and he sent a copy of his book to all his competitors. Right? Because for him, you know, the purpose is not his organization, you know, whether they end up with 50 or 80% market share, who cares? What is important is that, you know, all patients can get this kind of treatment, whether it's him or some other people. And so he accepts you know, all invitations, all of his competitors at some point have invited him to just want to understand, you know, who is this guy who's eating our lunch? And he always goes there, speaks about it, um, and most of the time they listen very you know, carefully but then say thank you because, you know, there wouldn't be much work for most of them, right, in, in these organizations. Um, there's even one organization that, called Zorka Accent, who, is, who was very interested and has really gone down this route, and Joseph Bloch and another guy are doing active consulting for that competitor. Um, and so far, he's never sent a bill. You know, he's just said, like, I never thought about it, I never, right? Um, so as a, you know, really an illustration of how, you know, how fundamental purpose is when you take it seriously. So that part about purpose is still pretty easy to, I think, to understand. Um, but it gets a bit more, um, you know, more wild than that. You see, in most, traditional organizations, we have this paradigm that the role of leaders is to, you know, determine a vision, a strategy, and then some, you know, execu ex execution, some implementation plans to get there, right? That's the role of leadership, right? And, you know, makes perfect sense, right? I, how could it be, how could it be in any other way? When I started this research, that just totally made sense to me. But the leaders of these organizations say, no, no that's, not, that's not how it works for us. Uh, what they say is, you know, that perspective that leadership is about, you know, vision, strategy, execution, that makes sense if you think that the organization is an inanimate system, an inanimate object. You know, if you think that the organization is like a machine, then of course, yeah, you need to program it. The machine, you know, if you don't tell it the machine what to do, the machine doesn't do anything, right? <coughs> or if, you know, it, another metaphor we often use is, you know, the, the organization is a, is a ship, right? And the captain needs to set a course and then everybody else can set the sails and if all the sails are aligned, then, then we go into the right direction. 
They say, no, we don't believe organizations are machines. We don't believe that organizations are ships. We actually believe that organizations are like a living being, like a living system. We believe that the organization itself has a sense of direction, has a you know, creative spark, you know, has something that it wants to manifest. And our role as leaders is not to sort of arbitrarily say, hey, this is the direction where we need to go. But our role as leaders is to listen to where does this organization want to go? Okay. So here I might be losing some of you, right? Um, so the role of leadership is to say, where does this organization naturally want to go? And let's just align with that, because if the organization wants to go there, you know, if I try to go here, you know, we'll just exhaust ourselves fighting what we're naturally called to do. And that reflects itself again in a whole host of practices that these organizations do differently. You know, going from strategy to change management and planning and budgets and you know, setting targets, all of that again is, is quite different. So for instance, none of these 12 organizations that I researched in depth has a strategy. And all of them are really outrageously successful organizations and they don't have a strategy, which sounds crazy. They have a very clear sense, a very clear intent, like Bürtzorg. You know, we want to help people make, you know, live a more you know, rich, meaningful, auto autonomous life. But they don't have a strategy. Right? Most of these organizations don't have budgets, by the way. Um, right? Don't have targets. You know, salespeople without targets, sounds crazy, but um, because they say anything that we put in the ground is a distraction from reality, right? When we do that, when we try to predict the future, what happens is that we then stop actually listening to reality. We so much want reality to stick to the plan that we've laid out, right? That we stop listening to reality. So we should do the opposite. We should have a very clear intent of where we go, but then we should constantly listen and constantly adjust. And let, you, let me give you, again, one or two illustrations from Bürtzorg. First one is Bürtzorg Plus. So there were um, one of these you know, small teams of 10 to 12 nurses in, in one neighborhood who had this thought to say, hey, we noticed that a lot of these old people that we serve at some point fall down you know, and break their hip or break their knee. And by now we can do kind of routine surgery to replace it, but still people, you know, lose a whole lot of autonomy after that. And wouldn't it be great if we started doing prevention? And so they just um, called in some physiotherapists in, in their region and, you know, taught some of these people you know, how to be, you know, how to move, how to walk, how to, you know, be careful with certain gestures. They changed things in the homes of some of these people. And they made some lectures in the evening in the neighborhood. And people really responded really, really well to that. So it was a big, big success. They thought, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great if all of Bürtzorg did that? Right? But it would be kind of a big change of strategy. It would be, Bürtzorg isn't only treating people, Bürtzorg is now in the prevention business, if you want to call it that. And so they went to see Jos de Bloc, uh, you know, and said, hey, you know, it would be great if we did this nationwide, right? If, you know, all of the 700 teams, you know, operated in this way. And if Bürtzorg was a traditional organization, if Jos de Bloc was a traditional leader, you know, he would probably say either yes or no, right? Let's make a strategic decision. Yes, you know, this is our next growth area. Right? And then probably, you know, you know what would have happened, right? He would have you know, liberated some big budget, and then he would have made a, a plan and, you know, rollout plan, and, you know, we're going to do, you know, so many regions at the time, and, you know, at the end of a year, everyone will be Bürtzorg Plus, as they've called it. And what Jos de Bloc did was, he said, I don't know if we're supposed to go that direction, you know, how should I know? Right? Let's see if this is 
where the energy of this organization is going. And what he did was simply, he said this to this team, why don't you share what you've done with all other teams? And Birzorg has a really pretty fantastic um, internal social network where they can share these things. And so the team packaged their approach and said to all the other teams, whoever wants to do it, you know, here's a package of how you do it. Here's how you make a, you know, a kind of a contract with the local physiotherapists, and here's you know, how you organize an evening, and here's how you get it. Anybody else who wants to do it can do it. And lots of teams started doing it. Some teams even said, hey, we'd still like more hands-on training. Don't you want to give us a training? We're happy to come over. And then they developed some training and then trained some trainers. And, and by now, more than 90% of all Birzorg teams have become Birzorg plus teams. And some teams don't, for whatever reasons, they don't feel like it. And no one is forcing them. If anyway they don't want to do it, you know, you could force it, they, they probably wouldn't do a good job, good job at it anyway. Right, so the, the system naturally moved into that direction. There was just energy for it. And now suddenly, after the fact, you realize, hey, Birzorg is now also doing prevention. But it wasn't a, a big strategy that was planned. And what you see a lot in these organizations is innovation happens at all you know, corners. And like in an ecosystem, some of these innovations are powerful and they spread quickly through the whole ecosystem. And other innovations, no, they don't work and they fall off again. But it isn't, you know, a central steering that will decide, hey, this will work. You actually let reality decide what works and doesn't work, rather than trying to impose it. And in the same way, they have now an experiment going on, and we don't know yet whether it will work. Um, there's another team who said, you know, often these old people have a partner, have, you know, a husband or a wife that is often, you know, old too. And it's you know, terribly tiring to have to you know, deal with somebody sick. You know? And so these people become exhausted and very often become sick too. You know, maybe we should do something for them. And one of the nurses had just inherited an, whole, an old um, uh, you know, house in the countryside. And they said, hey, why don't we make a boarding house where we take in the sick people for a few days so that the husband and wives can just you know, relax for a few days. And they've done it, it works really well, people are very happy. And again, they went to Joss the Block, and Joss the Block just said, hey, if you want to talk about it, we just happen to have, you know, in a few weeks from now, the big gathering where all 8,000 nurses meet. Why don't you just present your idea? And we'll see if other teams pick it up. If they want to pick it up, I will make sure that there's money available to make it happen, and we'll just see. And so the jury's out, we don't know yet, so maybe you know, Birzorg will, next to prevention, go into the, you know, to the work of actually taking care of, you know, the partner too. Who knows, you know, is that where the organization wants to go? You know, reality will, will, will decide. So that's, you know, the, th the third breakthrough is, you know, not playing God anymore, but just listening to what wants to happen. So this is the, the summary of what I wanted to share with you today. So, you know, it might not be crazy to think that there is a new way to run organizations that is coming up, even though it sounds so different from what we're used to. Because this is what's been happening a few times before when we've gone, you know, from tribal to agrarian to industrial, etc. And the second thing I wanted to share is that, you know, if my research is correct, I believe that there is three breakthroughs in this new model that is just starting to emerge. One, this notion that we can operate entirely without power hierarchies, without anyone being the boss of anyone else. That will operate in environments that invite us to be, you know, showing up fully in the full glory of, of who we are. And that purpose will really come to send central, central, so much so that we don't make many plans. We just have a very, very clear intention. And we just listen to you know, what this whole organization wants to become. These are actually the, the first two parts of the, of the book I've written. There's a third part, which I, you know, won't talk about tonight unless you want to discuss it now in, in question and answer. I think we, we might have a, a half hour left. Um, 
there's a third question, which is this question of how do you get there? And so in the book, I've also looked at, you know, what are the necessary conditions? Can any organization just operate in this way? And if you start a new organization, you know, how, what do you start with? What's the most important of, of all of that? Or if you're in existing organizations, some of, uh, roughly half of the organizations I researched were traditional organizations, had a new leadership and transformed. And so, you know, what lessons can we learn from them? You know, how can you transform existing organizations in this way? Maybe one more thing before I forget, but then we do questions and answers. For those of you who are interested to find out more, I've gone very quickly about it. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of books outside, um, and if you're interested, you can just take one. It's a gift to you. Um, there isn't enough for everyone, but it's a collective gift. So when you're done reading, don't stack it in a bookshelf at home. Bring it back and recycle it to some colleagues. Okay, so it's a collective gift that can, you know, circulate. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, and now I'm, you know, very curious to see what does this trigger with you. You know, what what are some questions, challenges that this uh, this evoked? Can just uh, raise your hand. We have microphones. Either you shout very loud or you uh, speak into the microphone. In your uh, research, did you um, um, did you met uh, some some firms or for some organization that tried to do that and that failed, and and why? Yeah. Um, there's two organizations who've been operating who haven't tried and failed, they have operated like this for a long time very successfully. And after 10 or 20 years have reverted back because at some point the board appointed a new CEO that wasn't into this and that just wanted to have a good old pyramid and hierarchy. So what there are you know, two examples, two out of these 12 don't operate in this way anymore. And by the way, they've lost their magic, they've, they've lost you know, their, their financial results. Um, so that, that is a big risk. So what I've identified is that there's really two necessary conditions for this to work, is that the CEO and the board need to be fully convinced and aligned with that. If they're not, you know, being the board of such a company is pretty uncomfortable, right? Because, you know, I want to talk to the CEO, I want to talk to the CFO, I want to talk to the risk manager, I want to talk to... You know, and there's still people, of course, who do all these things, but, but it's less direct, right? And so what you see in terms of the first one, the self-management, is there's quite a lot of organizations today that, for instance, in the Silicon Valley or elsewhere, they are dissatisfied with hierarchy, right? Because we know that hierarchy generates all sorts of problems. And they, but the problem is they only go half the way. They say, let's throw out you know, all of the hierarchy. And but then you, have, then you end up have, having chaos. Then nobody knows how the system operates. And then you have little power games in the back to try to decide things and it's not clear and consensus and, and that is actually worse. So what you have to do is if you want to leave one system, you have to go to another system that's just you know, as coherent by doing all these things about you know, how do you make decision, how do you decide how, you know, how to invest, you know, who gets how much money, how do you resolve conflicts. They have to be different processes in place. You can't just say we'll get rid of, of something. So that's the biggest, the biggest failure. Well, I have two questions, in fact. First question is, um, do you think this kind of organization is uh, possible for a bank? Are there any sector which could not be, uh, which could not apply this kind of organization? And the second question is, are the, those three elements uh, really necessary, all of them, or one or two of them could, could be also good? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, to your first question, so in, in my research, I haven't come across a bank that works like this. So the jury's out. Um, I don't see any reason why it couldn't be the case. Um, let's take, you know, AES was a 
is a 40,000 people company, you know, electricity generating company. So they have power plants everywhere in the world. Huge success story, they started um, basically with zero people in the 80s and they grew very, very quickly to 40,000 people in, in 32 different countries, you know, really Tanzania, Uzbekistan. And they, a little bit like banks, they run very, very sensitive equipment, right? Running power plants or distribution grids is, is very, very sensitive equipment. So they have all of the same compliance problems, regu you know, regulators, you know, the, you know the, the maintenance. I mean, you know, you, you have to have a 100% uptime, you know, <laughs> in these industries, right? Uh, and they've managed to operate entirely based on the advice process. So, you know, I don't see why it wouldn't work in banks, but there's no example to show it or to, to prove it. Um, and to your second question, very good question. Yes, you don't really need to do all three. And, and some of these organizations, so for instance, Bürzor is very strong in all three. Um, um, Morningstar, the tomato companies, is incredibly strong on the first one. They've really nailed all of these processes. I mean, they're just beautiful. And the other two, they're not very, they're not very far ahead. So you, you can, but what you, what you see is, if you do all three, they build on each other. So for instance, this thing of, of Bürzor, of saying, hey, let all of these 700, 800 teams innovate. And as soon as one innovation seems to work, let's see if it catches on. You know, it's part of that evolutionary purpose. We don't know what the purpose is. You know, it just cross-fertilizes. Is made possible because of the self-management, because they have all these small teams. If you, you know, if you had a classical pyramid, it would be much more difficult. <coughs> or take another thing, like, you know, in pyramids, you know, power is by definition limited. You know, that's why, you know, we all want to move up the, the ladder, right? We want to, and that we know generates all sorts of things, right? We, we play games and we try to look good in front of our boss and we don't really say the truth to our boss and, you know, we, and so that piece, you know, if you get that piece right, you're already halfway there for wholeness. Right? It's so much easier in an organization where you don't have to play all these games, you know, to be, to be showing up whole. But there are some or organizations, um, there's two or three organizations in my research that still have some parts of the pyramid, but have put in place some of these aspects of, of wholeness, even, even without, you know, the fact that, you know, they still basically have a, a you know, good old pyramid. Who else? Do the clients of those organizations see and feel the difference? Mm. Um, very, depends on the industry. Very clearly in some, some cases, Bürzorg, it's, it's totally obvious, right? I mean, you have these, you have one or two nurses instead of having just a random nurse showing up. The nurse, you know, isn't hurried in time, doesn't, you know, can sit down for a coffee. I mean, it just does things. I mean, there's just plenty of examples. I've sat in some of these meetings of nurses and the level of dedication they go to is extraordinary. I mean, really, um, you know, the two, three nurses that know the same patient, you know, discussing things like, you know, the patients would be reassured to have their medication even if they don't take it, but the, the children think it's a bad idea. We actually think that the old person is right. The, you know, she isn't confused. She, she, she can handle her medication. How do we tell that to the children? I mean, they just go to these levels of humanity that is, is extraordinary. So clearly, birds are, yes. A, yes, the electricity company, you know, does the client that gets electricity out of the wall see that difference? Probably not much, right? Um, I mean, they, they would say that their uptime, you know, they, they often came into countries with, where there was maybe 30% uptime, and they b believe that that system has helped them increase that much faster than if they had gone traditionally, but, but no, you wouldn't sense much in, in that case. Or, you know, the tomato paste that you've eaten from Morningstar, very likely, you know, you've probably not tasted something different uh, because of that. Um, so it depends on the industry. If there's client-facing contact, yes. If there's not, then, then probably no. In those uh, companies where um, uh, they shifted from one side well, to this uh, new um, method, have you seen any where, where dropout? Where I, I don't. Can you raise? Ah, sorry. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Have you seen any dropout of people? Because maybe there can be 
and hurdle is that people, and I'm not talking about people um, putting away their uh, leader role, but yeah. people not feeling confident with self-management. Yeah, um, that's, that's really an interesting question because th that was really a paradox I, I, I stumbled upon. Organizations that have started right from the beginning in this way tell you, oh, you know, recruiting is really key. You have to recruit people who can you know, have the maturity, who want to operate in this way, you know, who want to take on responsibility. That's really critical. And when I heard that, it made a lot of sense to me. But then when you talk to the organizations that were traditional organizations and at some point have shifted, they tell you that the rate of people leaving because they couldn't handle it is actually very, very low. You know, I, I couldn't put a percentage on it, but it sounds like it's maybe two, three, four percent. So there is a, a, a real learning curve. There really is, right? Um, so some of the examples are blue collar firms where, you know, workers were just told what to do. You know, you go on that machine, you work for an hour, you make so many pieces and, you know. And so there, there, there tended to be kind of a strong culture of, you know, not wanting to take responsibility, being against management. And, and so it was a big shift for them. Um, but one that apparently pretty much everyone takes. And what a lot of these leaders say is the few people who don't make it are people who've been beaten so badly by the system that they, they just you know, prefer somebody make decisions for me. Yeah, I don't want a responsibility. Um, what is, so what is interesting in, in the organizations who've done the transition is that in the end, people at the bottom of the pyramid end up loving this, right? They just end up loving it because you know, they get so much more freedom, work is so much more meaningful. Um, and the difficult thing in the beginning is middle and senior management and all these staff functions, right? Because most of these organizations, I, I think I told you, um, you know, uh, Bürzorg, 8,000 people, 25. Uh, morning um, AES with 40,000 people in power plants in 32 countries had a headquarters of 200, right? So very few staff people. Um, and so for them, of course, it's very threatening. And, you know, some people leave because, you know, there might not be enough work to go around, but what you see is that a lot of people who in the beginning fight these changes because they say, hey, you know, you, ca you can't tell me that, you know, my role of management th didn't make sense, right? Basically what you're saying to people is you used to manage, well, it doesn't, we don't need that anymore. And so it's very, can be very hard emotionally, but what you notice is that people at the end end up loving it because uh, what they say is, you know, I used to be, you know, as a, especially as middle manager, squeezed between people at the top I had to please, people below I had to motivate and keep in line. And I spent all my time trying to motivate people and all these people problems and people below throwing problems at me. Um, and people, you know, staff functions pushing decisions down, which not, not always say it makes sense to me. And, and now I can finally go back to doing creative work again. You know, I can just do work, you know. Um, one of the fantastic things is that people in these organizations nearly don't sit in meetings, right? Because all of these alignments and these PowerPoints don't happen. There's, there was one case for me which was dramatic, which was the CEO of one, it's a publicly listed company in Florida. Um, they're a leader in making hydraulic valves, so very, you know, engineering, manufacturing kind of organization. And, you know, I noticed that their meeting rooms are always empty. You know, people use the advice process, just go, go around, talk with each other, or send an email saying, I plan to make that decision. Any comments? If there's no comments, I just make that decision. And, and, um, and so I asked to see his agenda for the week. And in that week, he had four meetings, and two of them were with me. <laughs> right? um, but he does real work. He just, you know, goes out there, talks to people, and, you know. He, um, so as a CEO, he actually takes on roles and initiatives just like, like he would do. And so for him, it's actually much more fun than, you know, he, ha he had been a very senior executive in a traditional company and he finds this much more, much more fun. Did that uh, answer your, your question? Cool. Yes, um, I do understand the part that um, those companies don't have a strategy because they have a real purpose and they follow that purpose or they reach that purpose and are successful because they follow the energy within the company and from the employees. Yep. What I'm having more difficulties to follow is they don't have budgets because resources are limited. Yep. Um, 
So it depends on the company. Some companies really don't have budgets. Um, if you take this company, Sun Hydraulics, making you know, hydraulic valves, um, publicly listed company in the US, uh, they don't have budgets, but the board, of course, asks them for one, so they quickly make one A4, which they give to the board, but which no one inside ever sees, um, because they, they have to. Um, but some organizations do have minimum budgets. What they actually do is to say, let's only make budgets for decisions where we need to have forecasts. So for instance, um, there's this French automotive supplier. They need to supply raw material contracts. Right? So they have to make some sort of estimate right, of how much metal they will, they will use. And so for that, they make a very rough budget. And the way the rough budget goes is they ask all teams, tell us what you think you'll make, we'll add them up, and that's our budget. So you don't go through the rounds of top management saying, hey, but that budget isn't really as good as we expected, so raise your targets, and then people, you know, grudgingly, and people actually aiming lower because they know they will raise it, so they play this game, right? So all of that is, you know, kind of dis disappears. So there's budgets to the degree that there's actual predictions that you need to make. And, but so what they don't do is follow up months by months and say to people, hey, why are you 10% below budget? Can you explain? And all of that falls away. The, the idea is, you know, if people self-manage, if, if people feel powerful, can just make any decision, if people show up fully and can be themselves and be creative, and if they have a noble purpose, people just want to do good work, right? You don't need to say, hey, that's your target. Why are, why are you below? If you're below, there's probably a good reason. Um, there's a story that I think illustrates this really, really well uh, from uh, Brian Robertson, um, a guy who um, founded Holacracy. And he says, let's imagine we would run a bicycle in the way we operate companies. I think it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful metaphor. He says, what would happen is we'd have this committee, right? That would make this three-year plan or would make this budget, right? That would plan into the future. We want to exactly go there and we do this by going this and then this and then this and this and would calculate everything up front, all the milestones and would calculate the exact angle at which we need to hold the thing, and then after exactly so many seconds, we need to you know, do this, and then you know, two minutes later, we do this, right? and we calculate that. And then we go, and we close our eyes, and we try to follow exactly the plan. Right? And what, of course, happens is something in reality wasn't quite as we expected. There's a small hole, or there's a, you know, the, there's a stone, and we fall over. Right? And then we know exactly what to do, right? We need to first probably fire the person you know, who did the calculations, and the next time we need to calculate even better. That's what he says, right? So that this doesn't happen again. And what he says is, of course, we don't ride bikes in that way. Bikes, when we ride them, we know exactly where we want to go. And then what happens is we just go and we put all of our senses, conscious, unconscious, you know, the wind on our muscles, the everything in alert, and constantly adjust to what is happening. Right? And that's how, how these organizations operate. Right? So I know it, it's, a bit, it's a bit strange, right? I mean, I, I had a few months in this research to get used to this. I'm throwing it all out at you. So you know, I'm not surprised if, you know, if this is, is new. And, uh, I'm thinking of your old life. Are the consultants moving towards advising uh, about these uh, new ways to function? Yeah, so a, a lot actually. There's um, so the the book is doing surprisingly extraordinarily well, and uh, you know in the emails and stuff I receive, there's a lot of consultants who want to go in this direction. Actually, there's m many more consultants than there is CEOs ready to go that road. <laughs> so there's all these consultants that are like, do you know a CEO who would be ready for this? Um, uh, so so yes. <laughs> Um, some of the things you described, like self-management and wholeness, is um, I think has a greater chance to catch uh, momentum with the young generation, the Y generation, because it sort of matches their own uh, aspirations. Yep. Do you see any signs of your ideas being caught up in the academic field or in SEAD type management schools? Do you see a change there, or are they still teaching the traditional approach? Um, both. Um, so. I know that there are some professors at Harvard who've um, made my book mandated reading and use it as part of their curriculum, for instance, so, and other professors in, 
in the US to do that. Um, and at the, at the same time, you know, there's a long way to go. I mean, basically all of what we're told in business school is this kind of orange thinking, right? And, and partially green, um, right? So, so many professors are just deeply into that. And when you tell them about this, they, they say, you know, that won't make any, wouldn't make any sense. Um, I've, there's one business school in France which has contacted me and I, I'm quite excited by that project. They, um, it's, a, it's a small one, they have 100 students and they want to do a three-day experiential game and ask me if I wanted to participate and, and I said, um, yes, I, I'd love to. And we agreed that you know, I'd participate if, if they make it open source so that we package it and other schools can then reuse it. And the idea is to put the, 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 the 100 students into four groups of 25 students that run organizations. So I, I won't make the mafia style, so the red one, not. But you know, the, the amber you know, army style, the machine style, the, the family style, and then the new style. And so they operate in entirely different structures, but doing the same thing, right? So for instance, in the amber style, you know, the CEO and the two middle managers you know, will have nicer dinner than the other people and will drink from you know, porcelain cups and the other from plastic cups and you know, will build you know, these, these kind of details into the system. And then the orange one, you know, people are working, but then there's always these staff functions that come in and interrupt them. And they, yeah, but hey, we have to exchange best practices. You know, of course we should exchange best practices, but now I'm, I'm, I'm just working, but no, we can't, right? And then there's a budget to make and there's a, right? Um, and the idea is really to experience it because this new thing seems so crazy un until you actually experience it, right? Um, and so the, the idea is that we trying to build in this kind of Beardsorg thing where as of the second day, people can, you know, send their CVs to other teams. And so when we're curious to see what happens if, if some of these <laughs> go empty, <laughs> right? And, and others become bigger because people want to join them. Um, and so we, this is still an idea. I'm, I'm, I'm scripting it for the moment. We, we hope to do that in the spring of next year. And then to really package it so that other business schools can do it and maybe even organizations. So, you know, if you guys want to run it, if, you know, that seems scary, actually just run it, experience it for three days and, you know, and see what it, see what it does. Well, thank you. Um, and then we'll, uh, I think, share a bit more time outside and do grab a, a book if you want to, you know, find out more about it and then circulate it back when you're, when you're done with it. Okay. Mm -hmm.